On the left, there's a team of four of us in, re in the reforestation team from the US, all volunteers. Thus, we're all old because who else can volunteer if you're not retired? So, the, so Paul is a forester background and uh, retired as an associate deputy chief. Dave Atkins, the next guy going across to the right with the hat on. And he's from Missoula. His wife, Sheila, is involved with native plants, so you might know them. I'm the next one across with the hair in the face. And then last tall guy with a hat on is Joe and he is the nursery manager, retired nursery manager at the Coeur d'Alene Nursery. Up front in the pink shirt is Digi and she was our coordinator program and logistics and everything there in Mongolia and she works for ICCF. And then the next shorter guy with a hat on, he's our translator. So we always had a translator with us, luckily. Although things do get lost in translation, as you you know when you travel. So where, where is Mongolia? A few of you have been there, so you know it's halfway around the world, 12 hours away. And it is a frigid, dry country. The wind comes down, the air comes down from Siberia. It settles in in that plateau, um, or the main plateau surrounded by mountains. So it doesn't get a lot of... Uh, moisture really. It is a uh, democratic governance and it's the largest landlocked uh, sovereign nation in the world, as you can see. It is bordered, but it's, as they say, it's a democracy in a tough neighborhood um, bordered by Russia and China. And so they maintain a relationship and they're dependent on, um, Mongolia is dependent on Russia for for energy, like oil and gas, they're reliant on China. They do their mineral exports and some of that kind of uh, stuff to, to China. And I also appears that they get their stuff, you know, all their home goods and all that kind of stuff from China, just like we do, of course. Um, so, and this picture to the right was actually a fellow that we were um, talking or working with. And that is his spring traditional field coat. Um, he has another one for summer. He wears this one in the fall. And then for winter, he has one that's much thicker wool, I guess. But up front, they're, they're very unique um, uh, traditional wear for the ranch country. So it's at about 600,000 square miles and comparatively to Montana, which is 147,000. So it's about four times or three times bigger than Montana. No, four times bigger than Montana, uh, much wider. The latitude is similar. It's just about the same. So this picture is kind of uh, deceiving. It's showing relative size, but it really should be up, you know, closer, of course, to the border of Montana to compare the latitude. And that, that elevation is a little higher. Population of 3.3 million compared to Montana's 1.7. So a little quick history, of course, the indigenous people, traditional people go way, way back. But a couple of key, key points, 13th century was the empire of Genghis Khan. And that went through um, the largest empire ever, larger than Alexander the Great and everyone into Europe, and they revere uh, Genghis Khan. 17th century, it changed China, the Ging dynasty. And then what we saw that influenced the areas we were in was the 1920s, it came under Soviet control. It maintained its um, sovereignty, but it was, some people call it a puppet state of the Soviet Union. It was a socialist state and uh, named the Mongolia People's Republic. But we still see a lot of influence of uh, the Soviet era. When the Soviet Union fell in 1991, they adopted their democratic governance. And that is really still building. Um, and they're, they're working on really how to, how to adjust that 30 years later. So they are a new democracy in a rough neighborhood. So forest, pardon? Forest map of Mongolia, I just want you to look broadly at the colors. 
The north part of the country in that kind of yellow, that's boreal forest. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The center strip in the middle that's kind of white, that's um, a steppe grassland. And the bottom is what's considered the Gobi. It's kind of broken up in that brown color because it's picking out more of the Saxal forest versus the whole desert. And those, bi those are actually um, not discrete biomes, but within each of those types, there's a lot of different biomes. There's not just one kind of Gobi Desert. Yes, question? Oh, sac salt, and I'll talk about that again. Sac salt is the tree, is the major forest type. And the numbers on the, on the map are, Oh, and, and looking at that 9% boreal forest, 20% Gobi, and 60% steppe, which is grasslands. We went, number one is Ulaanbaatar, and that's the capital city. And we'll look at a couple of pictures of that. And it uh, drains into Russia, or maybe Russia. I'm not sure which way it drains. So. I think it drains into Mongolia from, from Russia, the H Henton Mountains and the Tula River Valley. Number two is South Kong province, and it's a very cold Kangai mountain region. And then south number three, we went to the Gobi near the Kanban. And I'll go look, show you a few more pictures. So 50, think of this, 52% of the people live on 99.7% of the land. So that's very, very dispersed. A lot of the people, live way off the grid, but they seem to have some resources, some, some things that make it livable. At this time, these are called gares. Yurt is a Russian word, so these are gares. And they're really just collapsible huts. And in uh, for nomadic herding, they collapse those up and all their stuff and they move it from pasture to pasture, um, usually seasonal. Uh, but do note, they do less nomad um, nomad travel these days. If you see here, there's a little satellite dish. Let's see, I guess you can't see that. Sorry, I'm gonna step away for the people here. There's a satellite dish, there's a solar panel. I understand that they, so I just pointed out the on the gear on the right, there's a solar panel and a satellite dish. They charge up their phones for, the, they they charge up a battery that then they can charge up their phone and uh, use their phone for an hour at night and or during the day and use their television for an hour during the night or something like that. Uh, but there's it's outhouse and running water, um, heat their gears with coal, uh, raw coal and wood. And they're, they're hurting and there is some small towns scattered around too. So the other 48% of the people live on 0.3% of the land. And the top left picture show is the city of Ulaanbaatar. And I don't know how many people live there, but I think they all drive a car and they have nowhere to park them as far as I can tell. Um, but it's becoming a more modern city. It was has a lot of influence still of Soviet buildings, apartments, but uh, pretty modern. And then below that, they call them gare districts, and they're people, migrants that have moved from the um, countryside into Ulaanbaatar for a variety of reasons, hurting um, disasters or where they've lost a lot of animals or come for comfort or um, children have to come in to Ulaanbaatar or a city or a town to go to school. And then on the lower right, it's kind of an in-between. I just think those are really pretty with the colors and stuff. So that was um, kind of a little stick houses kind of spread out. So we met with a lot of officials, government, um, United Nations, uh, other agencies. Uh, we met with um, uh, ministers, uh, caucus members. We met with um, academia, professors um, uh, and lots of forestry specialists within the government and outside. And we found that they were all very anxious to share and they were very anxious for our thoughts and input too. So it was a very great interchange. And these pictures 
we um, are at the school, the university's forest. And this fellow straight through with the black hat on, while we were out looking at sites, he was cooking us lunch. We brought the lunch supplies, but he cooked us a nice hot lunch, which was great because that was that snowy day when we saw that um, the fellow in the traditional outfit. And then down below is a gal that uh, we went to a nursery, a private nursery, and she knew we were coming, so served us tea and these nice treats. So we always had food when we, or tea for sure, and coffee, and very hospitable and very friendly people. So the boreal forests, we were, we got there in the fall and we knew that there was gonna be large, but it just gets you, you, you flow on for, I don't know, three days or so, I don't know, not that long, 28 hours, I think. And you get there and the larger are turning gold and you just go, wow, we know those, we know those trees. So that was pretty cool. We knew um, Siberian larch, Laryx siberica. And then there was a five needle pine, which is a, a love of mine. Siberian pine. It does have pine nuts. We did hear a nutcracker, but they don't have the strong relationship that white bark pine do, but they do collect the pine nuts. And, and a Scots pine, like the ones, two needle pines, like you get in the garden centers. And, and then Siberian spruce, Picea obovata. So those are the three main boreal forest conifers. And then there was also birch, a cottonwood, which they called aspen, which confused us for a little bit, and elm. And then in the Gobi, we the Saxel Forest. That's um, it's kind of a half tree, half shrub, large, but it's a it's a major. Uh, it's important for the wood resource as well as the native indigenous um, values. And then to the right is elm, and you see those scattered out in the desert. The crown is raised up because of animal browsing, particularly camels. So those are the desert woodlands. And then there's very dependent on lots of different shrubs. So before I go into more forestry, I want to talk a little about the issues with herding. Um, as we saw, half the, half the population is hurting on, on a very large piece of land. And with the, actually, uh, there's a decrease in the nomadic lifestyle, so they're not moving, they're staying put. And with that, with their animals, they're using more grass and actually causing a um, decline in the grass quality and diversity. I asked about whether there was invasives and we never heard about invasives, but it had gone from a multiple number of species down to four or something like that. So there was a big change in the grass quality. And with that became smaller animals because the grass is poor. And so then they increase their numbers because you still have to have the meat and the income. And so the numbers I saw, or we were told, was that they're about at three times the carrying capacity. So instead of 30 million grazing animals, it's up 90 to 100 right now. So that's an issue the other team's working on, but it does affect reforestation significantly. Uh, lower, and with those, the numbers increase and the food is poor, then of course the animals are smaller, so they have lower meat production, poor wool quality, one of the main problems is that there is open grazing practices and that's the law is if it's not fenced off, you can graze there. So there is um, a lot of grazing. And then uh, they really need just the final, they really need sustainable grazing practices adopted and put into law. So back to the forest. So why do they need to plant a bill in trees? It's because they've had a significant decline in, in forest cover. One of the big ones in the whole boreal forest, that northern portion of the country, is defoliators. Big expanses of dead trees. As you can see in this picture, these were uh, larch trees. And uh, spongy moth, which used to be called gypsy moth, is with the um, is increasing in spread. And it's a lot drought caused, which of course is related to climate change. There's also a lack of forest diversity, partly because of uh, various practices. There is a fire history, but there really is an age class diversity and species diversity. And we saw that with the management, they didn't um, enhance the diversity. 
And they tend to be relying on control. So they want lots of, they want more money for planes and pesticides. And the pesticide or the pest specialists, uh, health protection, they're on the uh, really an integrated pest management, a sustainable uh, integrated way. You can't, they said, you can't spray yourself out of this. It's too big. The uh, um, forest is in a condition that you can't stop it on its own just by spring. So fire has been increasing and that is uh, decreasing the forest cover. Um, increased fre frequency during the weather. There's certain months that are changing more than other months. I think it's the May and September and the overall drought. The lack of forest mosaic, the lack of firefighting resources. They don't have engines sitting at every ranger district and firefighting personnel and all that stuff. So they're going out with their buckets and shovels and their um, government foresters, you know, all five of them out there. Um, and they don't have a lack of su sufficient prevention tools. And I, by that, I mean, there's people out there going into the woods and they're not careful with fire. And so they spend, the rangers spend all their time just trying to find people starting fires instead of doing more progressive things. So um, that's a that's a big problem. Logging, um, decreasing the forest cover. We didn't see too much of that, or didn't see really any. This is a logged area that we see in the foreground, but there's illegal and uncontrolled harvest, probably a lot of uncontrolled. Um, and the loss of forest cover has to do with the poor harvest practices. I think they must use big dozers and even with skylines and stuff, it's really causing a lot of soil damage. One study I read said that the uh, natural regeneration where there, there wasn't logging was you know, significantly greater than where there was logging due to soil compaction. We did see that roads are not constructed, so they're just driving where they wanna drive and there's a lot of soil damage. There's a lack of a reduced natural regeneration of planting. So that obviously is the, the reduction of cover. And uh, really the final answer for some of this is a need for sustainable forest management, which considers the social, ecological, and economic um, needs. So that, uh, whoops, we're gonna go in this picture, we're walking across to that large fire area straight across through that wet area. and. We'll go up to the top of that, that burn. So the other big thing affecting regeneration is grazing. And that's why I introduced that. In that unit that we went to that was across the, the drainage, we thought there's spruce all around it and we, there's nothing growing, nothing except for at the very top. And then we started looking around a little bit, we see this guy here um, around this log that's down. And once we started seeing it, but in that protected area, there was the hardwood shrubs growing. And then we started finding a few little seedlings um, to you in the room, I'll show you. So here's those little sticks, that's, that's where it's been browsed off. So there was no control on the grazing. So. Um, they lost a whole uh, ability to regenerate. You can see the effects on the picture on the right. There's a fence about in the middle and on the uh, stuff to the above the fence, there's hardly any vegetation. Below the fence, it, it hasn't been grazed heavily and you see quite a bit of vegetation. The problem is, is herders will see that nice green grass on the other side of the fence. So they breach the fence, so they can get to that nice green grass. So they don't have the enforcement that would help eliminate that. And that really is a, a big problem. And another really big one, which was new for me, and I don't have a full understanding, but it's the declining permafrost. There's That's what it's, what was ex described as this you know, layer of frozen soil, and it's uh, holding the water that comes down in the rooting zone of plants. Well, as it decreases and lowers, then the water that's held in the soil is lower than the rooting zone. And, 
And so then the trees have the effect of drought, of course. And then also other permafrost is actually melting. And so it's, it's moving and there isn't permafrost, which besides not being suitable for, for plants, there's less water than coming in just like from bones and um, been in the soil and then it releases methane and CO2 then and adds to the climate change issues. So, so this was at the school, the university um, forest. And so part of their climate station with a monitoring station is a permafrost monitor. And I don't know what it does underground, but somehow it's able to measure permafrost. So that was neat to see that there was ways to do that. So the, back to the planting of billion trees, um, they intend to plant to combat climate change. We kind of talk, talked about that. Um, the responsibility for restoring these forests, and people are buying into this, is the government, of course, and then mining companies who are probably the richest business in Mongolia. They have a very large mineral base and not very much money is coming back to the country yet because they're developing. But mining companies are responsible to commit to so much acreage or financial or something in reforestation in parts of the country in addition to where they uh, mine. And then citizens, everyone's supposed to be empowered to, to plant trees and that's kind of cool. So they're really enthusiastic and they have lots of skills. They need some technical assistance to even do better. The picture on the left, um, if you can see that, that's larch that's just starting to turn. Those were planted by school children 10 years ago. So that was a great example of community involvement in um, improve, or, uh, to reforest. And then the picture on the right, we went out to a nursery that was planting a park and uh, where I'm in the purple shirt and we're contributing to the 1 billion trees, planting two trees, two shrubs actually, but yeah. So that's part of the whole uh, community involvement. So now I'm gonna talk a little more specific about the three areas we went to. This is, Ulam, we'll start with Ulaanbaatar. This is the um, Ulaanbaatar's director of the environment. And I'm, did I mention that Ulaanbaatar is kind of like DC where it's an a, a entity unto its own. So it's not part of a province, it's managed, but it's quite large. So they manage themselves independently of the other provinces. And so he was asking for our, well, he shared a lot of issues with us and then was asking to update their practices and give them some ideas for updating. So this is a little bit hard to see, but the first picture on the left, they planted this fire area 10 years ago, I think they said. They planted it with all larch. They planted a thousand trees per acre. It was 2,500 per hectare at about a one foot by four foot spacing. Uh, the tree forestation that I typically involved in now, the highest it had ever been in my career was 800 trees per acre. And now more about the 450 on these kinds of, of large sites. So very dense and they didn't account for naturals. So that red line in the first photo is kind of showing this straight line. They, they auger, create the holes with the auger. And then I think they hand plant, I, I believe but they uh, machine auger. So they're in a straight line. That's what I was trying to show with that arrow. And then birches come up and as we filling in, and then as we looked um, even further, we found natural birch, obviously, um, more pines, both Scots and Siberian. We found spruce and we found more larch. So really they, in our minds, we, they way over planted way too tight and then they didn't account for naturals so they really overstocked this land which creates a management issue for them into the future to keep trees healthy besides using up resources seed and all that kind of stuff but they did get very good regeneration we went to a variety of nurseries 
Generally, they had hoop houses, which is what this um, little greenhouse type um, structure, what we called them, the sides roll up so they can be retractable. And it's really just uh, affecting the temperature and some wind. But if they would have had a climate controlled where you're controlling temperature, light, fertilization, all that, they would have much faster growth and much um, better, better products. But this nursery was a really, uh, these guys were really good. I did think that on the right hand side, they sowed at high density. We would tend to plant them more like a how wide we would want them after a, a few years. But they'll transplant this three or four times before they extract them in five years. So um, they're pretty dense, huh? <laughs> so uh, this nursery, their seed source was from the local area. They went out and picked them. Um, but that's not always true, we don't think. Sometimes we, but they do have a seed source map, a genetic seed source map at the university developed. And, but we didn't really get the feeling like it was quite adopted fully um, because seeds not available. So let's see from China is pretty good too, you know. Uh, other plant nurseries we went to were for planting green belts and parks. And they had a lot of species, which was really encouraging. Um, again, hoop houses, not climate controlled. The plants are transplanted numerous times. And generally the ones we went to that were for these green belts and stuff, they weren't local seed and may not be quite so important um, when you're doing the, you know, wind barriers along roads and stuff like that. But we did, did um, ask about that. So these are just, this is just one, it's actually a Korean home nursery there in Ulamantar, but that's part of the whole greening of the country. We did look at planting quality. Uh, Nora knows my experience, so she, she probably doesn't think that's surprising. So we see on the left, you see a little larch tree, looks pretty healthy. We think it was probably just planted, uh, this was in the fall, planted in the spring. But then when we dug it up, we see that the roots aren't going down. So these trees, the contractor's only responsible for three years to keep these alive and then they're paid off. These guys could, could last three years, but they are not gonna last a lifetime. So that was unfortunate. And I don't know if that's, I didn't do a full statistical sample, but you know, that was kind of discouraging. So we did talk with their um, specialists about some of our, our quality control inspection and stuff like that, that they might wanna think about. So this was kind of a cool uh, surprise. This was in the spring. We went to this large stand up in the top left, planted in the 70s. It had good spacing, healthy trees. We asked where the seed came from. The 70s, they were under Soviet control. So we're thinking they're probably from Russia. So we kind of suggested maybe they wouldn't use that as a seed source for the rest of their forest when it matures. Um, but the big thing for this stand were these past flowers. So there is the purple one um, and then a yellow one. And I don't know if we have yellow ones, but we were pretty, pretty jazzed to see the um, um, past flowers out there. Felt like we were, we were home in a large stand with past flowers. The National University of Mongolia, I've mentioned good things about their academia and, and the advancement and their knowledge. Um, probably when you get to the field foresters and stuff, it's not all communicated and adopted. That was one suggestion that, that we had was to, to get that information flowing out to the field so they adopt those practices. One thing about Ulaanbaatar is it is a city of contrast. In the front, you see this old, um, this Buddhist temple, historic Buddhist temple. And then in the back, you see brand new apartments being built. You see cranes everywhere in the city. You could even rent that, a room in that building, call that, that number. There's probably Soviet flats in between two that I can't see in that picture. So that was kind of interesting seeing that contrast. 
Uh, we did get a chance to go to this traditional dance and music performance. They wouldn't let you take photos of the performance. So we, I took pictures of all the, you know, stuff on the walls. But have any of you that have been, to, have you seen them do the, um, what's the, oh, throat, throat singing. Yeah. So it's coming out of their throat and their nose, and it sounds like an instrument. It is totally amazing, beautiful. That was probably one of my favorites, but there was contortionists and um, that's, uh, the fiddle head uh, or the horse head fiddles. The costumes you can see are really ornate. And I think it was different eras through the Mongolian history. Most of the people are Mongols, so you don't get a, a variety of different backgrounds per se, but there was a lot of different history and also different portions of the country, I think. They were all talking in Mongolia. The tourist season hadn't opened, so they didn't have their English interpreter for us, so we were kind of guessing. Whoops. One of the fun things we did, we went to the black market, which is really just a big flea market. They call it the black market because during the Soviet area, they had a State Department store, and that's where you went for everything. And that still exists, but it's just a beautiful mall, um, modern stuff. But the black market was fun because you could buy a satellite dish, you could buy um, the top left are the specialized boots for Mongolian horses and saddles. You can buy school uniforms. Um, on the lower right, this lady had me try on a hat, which if I were to ever go to Mongolia in the winter, I'd be going back for that hat. <laughs> so that was a fun, fun field trip. Then outside the, um, outside of the black market and in other parts of the city, there was pine nut street vendors. I don't know if they were legally collected pine nuts, but they would have a lot of them. And these are unshelled and locals can just like eat it like a sunflower and spit out the seeds, not me. I got it all in my teeth. So I didn't eat the, the unshell pine nuts, but primarily it's exported to China for processing and then imported to Mongolia and other places, all packaged and shelled. But that was cool to see that. Then there was a lot of small farm, not a lot, but there was small farm farm production, we did see some greenhouses. The picture on the top left is sea buckthorn, which is uh, kind of used like vitamin C. You know, you go into the little store and it's with cough drops and all that kind of stuff. There was hay for supplemental feeding on a small scale. That's typically not done, but it is uh, uh, has to be done in some cases closer to town. And then some garden crops. So they did have a variety of, of uh, farm production to a point. Most of their food though is meat because that was traditionally what they could hold through the winter and they had plenty of it. And it's hard when it's minus 60 degrees to grow much lettuce. <laughs> so they are very meat dependent traditionally, especially out of the country. So these are just a few pictures of the steppe close to Ulaanbaatar. On the lower left is an ohu, I'm not sure exactly how to say it. And you'll see those all around um, in little small, like little temples all around the, um, the city. And they're worshiping their sh shaman um, deities. Um, a lot of people use it for safe travel. And one thing I read said that they, traditionally you would go up to it and go around three times and you know leave your prayer. Now life's quicker, so it's okay just to honk. <laughs> so, but it's really pretty country as all pictures of Mongolia show. Yeah. So we went to, then we went to Zavkan, which is in the upper um, right-hand side of the country. We're bordering Russia. It's the oldest province in the country. He said minus 50 C, and I'm going to guess that's maybe minus 70 Fahrenheit. I was going to look that up and I forgot, but it's even minus 50 Fahrenheit is pretty darn cold. We flew into that little little um, airport there, grass runway, and that was our view flying into Zavkan. It was in the spring, so it still had snow from the winter. And you can't see it so much in this picture, but as we looked down, we could see those gears. I mean, they were teeny, but you could see 
them scattered out and how widely distributed there are. And it just brings up tons of questions. Well, how do they get their stuff? What, when do they, how do they go to town? When do they go to town? What town do they go to? But it was, it's quite a large country. So the first question the, the um, Zavkan people had for us, we had about five or six government officials with us who wanted uh, to talk with us. That in the background was a 2002 wildfire it burned 180,000 acres. It burned for two years. And Siberian Larch is pri the primary regeneration. There is grazing, but because so much land was burned, you know, there's so much availability of graze that they're not having a problem with that. I can't say the name of that park, but it is a national park. And so you see, it's just the park sign. It's not, there's no entry gate. We didn't have to do anything but it is a specially protected area. So this is an example. We're with a couple, couple of officials up there. You can see Dave Atkins and then two officials and that very dense natural regeneration. The problem is, is the government is not providing funding, providing funding for thinning. And so they're very worried about what's gonna happen. Well, they're just gonna, um, not grow and outcompete each other, a few trees might come out. But to really manage that, they let uh, salv people salvage the dead trees after a number of years, but they haven't done any other management or uh, really thinning is what they need. And in their national park, they can do, um, there's, it's kind of unclear exactly what all they can do, but they can do quite a bit at times. We did see some fire salvage coming out on the road. These are from um, that old fire. And it's coming into a small mill in um, the town that we went to. I can't pronounce that either. And so it's hauled up on that little Russian truck. It went into the mill and it's, it's part of it's cut up into firewood chunks and then put into bags and sold. And then also he was milling dimensional lumber. And his question was really wanted input on how to have value added products, you know, sawdust blocks and things like that that could be used. And that was really good. Dave Atkins is a kind of a wood specialist on alternative wood products. So they talked about ways they might do that. The problem with where they're located is that it's the transportation is really, really far to markets and it's really expensive during this. Soviet area, they had a large mill and it was the producer for a number of pro pro uh, provinces uh, for, for wood products, but the government paid for transport. <laughs> so um, that just sits as a skeleton mill now. So that was what, what we were talking about was how they can increase that value added wood products. This, we also looked at their local forest nursery. This was probably one of the ones that was least developed. They're close to a stream and that was their water source, but it's heavily grazed. They're not getting good regeneration. So we talked, we can, you can see this little lineup on the right of us um, all kind of kicking rocks and talking about what, what ways they could improve it. They're also very a long ways transportation wise from to planting sites. They didn't have any kind of covering. They had some trees covering, which sometimes that's not good because then you're shading your new seedlings. And they didn't have, I think they had an engineer as their nursery manager. And on the lower right, I put that photo in just because it's kind of funny. But as we're talking all this nursery stuff, our drivers are just standing on in, standing at the fence watching this. And they can't understand this. Well, they can understand their people, but they can't understand us. But little crows on the fence was that was kind of funny so the last oh future cashmere that's a cash crop mongolia mostly exports goat wool um, instead of processing themselves i just read that they mongolia is starting to make um, relations with the united states for pro for better cashmere um, products and stuff so that'll be be a good value added so whole field of future cashmere. This is a picture of some of that uh, country down by the national park, close to the nursery. You see there's a, this, there's actually a horseman 
right here. He's herding the, the sheep. And if you look closely a little bit at the front, you see animals along the creek side and they are just trashing the creek side, which is, you know, that was uh, one of the uh, observations that we gave is that uh, better protection of your stream zones. And this is probably also the water source for that nursery, that that's what they're watering their crops with. And of course, there's always food. So here's this little hut by the entrance to the little building, uh, entrance to the park, and the retired ranger's wife. I mean, it's it's got to be, oh, I bet the whole house is this part that doesn't have a table. So we're in this little room, about 10 of us, and she's cooking us a meal. And first she gives us milk tea. We finish that, and then she washes it with a little cold water and then puts in in a stew, you know, pasta and meat and some vegetables. And so we enjoyed that nice hot meal. So that was, that was really special and thoughtful. But she did it all, cooking in her living room. The town we stayed in is, you can see right here on the left. <laughs> um, you'll see down the middle is planted trees. They really like planting these hardwood trees for windbreaks and stuff in deep holes. And they made them in these giant divots. Sometimes you get it, but it's they're really, really deep. Um, but that's what they would look like. So that was their the efforts in their town to get some over um, story vegetation growing. It's kind of a modernish kind of town. We stayed in kind of a little modern hotel. Well, I mean, it's modernish compared to some places that we saw. We did see in the morning on the upper right, the farmer's market was out of the trunks of different cars. And then also our nursery manager on the lower right, he's negotiating some a raw wool purchase. Of course, you gotta have a translator and you gotta have a person you know, doing all that kind of stuff. But he's in the blue coat and the lady with the wool is in the uh, pink coat. And a favorite of the locals was freeze-dried yogurt. That's what they picked up to take home. So freeze-dried yogurt curds, like they kind of were good for a minute and then once they melt in your mouth, it's kind of like, mm, to be desperate. <laughs> But they were that, uh, our translator and our uh, coordinator, they were bagging that up. I got to take this to my family. So it must be a, a favorite candy, almost. So the third basic locale we went to was the Gobi Canbod area. The Gobi is very large, but we were just in this one little area about 30 miles from China. Our host was the Oyotoga Mining Company. They're a large copper mine just developing, all the copper goes to China, but they have a large effort to, I'm sure it's part of their image, but also their contribution to their country. They're expected to help in the cost and in implementing restoration projects throughout the country. So they're actually that fire area that I told you we went to, Oyotoga OT, if you will, they are the ones that are gonna reforest that, they're gonna plant that, fence it and plant it. So this is the mine above ground buildings, and then it's mostly gonna be an underground mine. And we were getting checked in, make sure we didn't have any alcohol or pot or anything. So then as we were our goal, besides talking with and learning from the uh, mining company officials and, and their efforts in restoration and some about the mining, we were going to, our goal was to go out to their nursery and this was quite impressive. But on our drive out to the nursery, this is the country that we saw. And the roadside vegetation, I believe was Pomerian winter fat. When we got to the nursery, I asked him what it was. Well, I asked him out there and she couldn't translate. She couldn't say anything I could understand. So she showed it to me in the nursery. Uh, one thing with, obviously, as you know, with scientific names, it is does help because you do have a little bit of a common uh, language there. But those are, uh, the winter fat is really good browse. It's hardy and it provides some um, 
cover over the sand to keep it from blowing so hard and provide some food for the critters. So this was the at the OT nursery. Um, Alta is the nursery manager on the upper left. She was wonderful. Um, she has a very advanced nursery for the nurseries that we saw and was very willing to share. And also our nursery manager that we had on our team had some, uh, well, he gave it to every nurse who went to a, a plant, made a plant propagation book and had some ideas for her. So that was really fun. They do plant really large seed or seedlings because even when we went out in the field, on the lower right, that large seedling container, I don't really know how they transport that through the unit to plant them. I don't know who the, how they do that, but they're heavy and dense. But they had, they had did their own seed collection and then propagation and then had them for outplanting. So this is, they were, they were growing 35 native species for restoration in the Gobi. So this is just a little, a few of them. I think, um, Annie, you're going to appreciate that they're growing bindweed and spreading that out. <laughs> <through> the... <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but you probably care, Gana. The blue iris, wouldn't that be a beautiful thing to see out there in the desert or the wild onion? Um, so that this was, uh, we looked at a lot of, a lot of plants. The wind was howling. So a little almond, Mongolia almond. So we were quite impressed with their, their operation there, and we were encouraging the, the mining company to invest further into their seed, seed lab and seed um, practices. They had a, she had a demonstration garden, and she says, well, I need to show people I can grow more than sack salt. So she has this demonstration garden with all the signs and easy to get to. It's not exactly downtown anywhere, but I'm sure some people stop by. This was, we were, got caught in a, just a quick windstorm. And I found out why, at least in the field, why they plant that winter milk fat deep is because they, if these guys are about five years old, uh, the little plants, and they would have been totally covered. So they were kind of in divots so that they could, the sand could come and go. And this was, OT was planting this because to restore an old power line that had been, um, the vegetation had been removed and never replaced. And when we first heard about the, the Gobi trying to reforest or add plants, we were kind of really, like we're trying to expand forest cover or something. But what we learned more was that they're restoring. So it's areas that are suitable and had been had plants on it versus trying to grow where you're not going to be successful. So of course we had to eat. So we went into town, this little um, restaurant, and we had a big plate of, I think they might be sheet knuckles with lots of meat on them and one little half potato a piece and one little carrot and lots of meat and uh, milk tea. So those uh, three folks on the far side of the table, they're locals and they were they were digging in. We were kind of picking at the bone and the grizzle and stuff. They were going for it. But it was good. It was a nice local place. And just about my last one, two humped camels. They're not common around the world. They use them for milk, wool, and caravan travel. The picture on the lower right is not my picture, but it's to depict how they would move there during from camp to camp throughout the seasons where there was fresh grass. And so they were really essential for that. Now they're using them for milk, wool, that kind of thing. And they're bacteria in camps. And I didn't get to ride, but we didn't get to do that kind of thing. Just some more pictures of the, the Gobi where we were. Um, the top right one, there's a couple of gears. And then they had an outhouse that was physically lashed to the ground, or it would have been in Korea probably. But they were going to have some dignitary meeting. So they were taking them out to this, this camp. And then in the lower one is a view of one of 10 sacred mountains, um, the Gobi Guruan. Saikon, I think you say it. And that's really important to the indigenous people there in Mongolia. And last one. Thanks. Had a little bit of a late start. I hope I didn't 
didn't over talk my welcome. It was a great ship. I'm involved now with working our team with some legal folks in re helping to revise the forestry laws in Mongolia, which is part of what ICCF does is work with the governance um, to engage their caucuses on conservation issues. So that's been quite of experience and I've learned, learned a lot. So with that, I'll ask for questions. Thanks. Questions? So do they have private land there or is it all public land? A citizen, the question from Peter is, is there private land or is it all public land? A citizen, as I understand it, can get an acre and they fence it. Um, and so you'll see like in some of those little city areas, they'll you'll see these scattered little fenced, which seems kind of contrary to where the open land feeling that you get. But I think you have to um, fence it so it doesn't get grazed, I would assume. So their small parcels are are private. Mm -hmm. so, you show pictures of herds of, of sheep and stuff. That's public? That's public. They don't call it public, but yeah. Yeah, it's just open. Just 